So uh, one of the fun things I get to do is uh, uh, being at a university, get to explore topics that I find interesting, uh, although uh, might be a little aside from the sorts of things that I teach. One of those uh, is a new line of research uh, that I'm beginning with uh, some folks over in the ecology and evolution uh, department. Uh, uh, one of them is Sarah Kobe, uh, who's a professor there, and the other is Frank Wen, uh, who is both a student in uh, ecology and evolution, also uh, in the medical school. So the topic of this uh, discussion uh, or this research uh, is really uh, how to uh, understand the relationship between vaccination policy uh, for seasonal flu uh, and I assume everybody here is, is familiar with that sort of vaccination. You get asked to, to do it every year. Uh, and with uh, the severity uh, of uh, flu itself, okay? And I think that if you, if you look at the existing the literature, uh, you get the, the following kind of simple, relatively simple picture, which is, hey, um, uh, flu uh, uh, is an infectious disease. Uh, so when you get sick with the flu, not only do you suffer some health consequences, but you can infect other people. So you know what you ought to do is you ought to go get uh, a vaccination. And if you get a vaccination, you have two benefits. One benefit is that you are less likely to get the flu this year and suffer sickness, you know, be out of commission for a week. The second benefit is that you're going to prevent other people from getting infected. You're going to have that positive externality, uh, and that's a good thing. So those are the two things that go on. Now, one of the interesting things that you might have noticed if you thought about it is, why is it that I have to get vaccinated for flu every year, but say something like measles, I just get vaccinated once in my life, I'm done. And the answer is typically that flu changes each year, meaning it uh, evolves uh, each year. Okay, and sometimes new strains arise, but even, even just the seasonal flu that we talk about, H3N2, evolves over time. So the vaccine, we think the vaccine that you're going to get this year is not going to be as effective, you know, uh, uh, against flu next year, the year after, and so on. Okay? So that means every year you may have to get a, get a vaccination just to make sure you get that private benefit of stopping yourself from getting sick, but also the positive social benefit of preventing other people from getting sick. Make sense? Okay, that's what makes flu different uh, than um, measles. But here's a really interesting question. Why does flu evolve? Okay, why, why does it change year to year? Why does measles stay still and why does flu evolve? And so one of the interesting things is, uh, uh, um, you know, the standard response is, will it respond, uh, the flu changes or moves because it's trying to avoid immunity that's built up in the population each year. Okay, it mutates and the mutations that survive are the ones that avoid that, the, the, the immunity that you guys have. And, and the conventional wisdom was you, you acquired immunity by getting sick, okay? So if you, if it, if it, despite the vaccine or because you didn't take the vaccine, uh, some of you got infected, uh, what will end up happening is that while you suffer some health harm this year, in future years, your existing sickness will prevent future, uh, you know, prevent you from getting flu in the future, right? It, standard immunity. But the flu, which is constantly mutating, uh, is more likely to survive if it moves away from that immunity. Does that make sense? And so the standard thought is, Flu evolves to avoid what is called natural immunity, immunity built up by some people getting sick in the population. Okay? That's why it keeps moving. That's the, that's the textbook answer. But you've got to ask yourself, well, hold on a second. Well, what about vaccination? Doesn't vaccination, you know how vaccination works, right? We give you either active or inactive version of the, uh, of the infection, a small amount, not to get you sick, but just enough to build up your immunity, right? But if that's building up your immunity, shouldn't vaccination also affect the evolution of flu? Right? As it turns out, the existing literature on uh, flu vaccination and flu evolution doesn't think about that very much. It just assumes that flu drifts through space for some other reasons uh, unrelated to, to vaccination. Uh, and the only goal of vaccination is just to each year change where, what exactly the strains are we're vaccinating against so that vaccination is most effective for where the flu is in genetic space that year. Everybody get it? But, but the problem here is the theoretical reason why, why flu evolves is also an argument for why vaccination should affect the evolution itself. Okay? That's the key insight. Standard conventional wisdom is flu evolves irrespective of vaccination. It evolves because of natural immunity. What we're attempting to say is, wait, the same reason flu evolves in response to natural immunity is a reason why it should evolve in response to vaccination itself. So your vaccine policy is going to affect that evolution. 
And that has implications for what optimal vaccine policy is. Okay? How often you get it, what the composition of the vaccina- vaccine ought to be, what the benefits of vaccination are. That's basically what we do. That's the, basically the lot bigger question that we're trying to address. So how do we address this? Well, we start out by taking the cutting edge model, the existing cutting edge model of how flu evolves genetically each year. Okay? It's an off the shelf model. It's a model, however, that only accounts for evolution in response to people getting sick, not in response to people getting immunity from vaccination. What we do is we tweak that model and we, it's, a simu- it's a computer simulation, and we add in the possibility that people, that flu evolves in response to that vaccination. And then we look at how flu affects the evolution, and we try to measure the value of vaccination itself. Is that clear? That's the, the basic idea here. Now, the way that I'm going to calculate the, the kind of the other methodological point that I want to make is that the way that I'm going to calculate, the way, the way we're going to calculate what the uh, value of flu is, is we're going to run these simulations. Okay? Now, these simulations are first going to be validated. We want to make sure the simulation, simulation actually matches what we see in the real world. But once it does that, we run some policy experiments where we say, okay, what happens if you increase the rate of vaccination, for example? What happens to the evolution of flu? We use the data that comes out of that simulation to give you some sense of the value of vaccination once we account for evolution. That's it. Okay? Not a trivial process, but that's the basic intuition. I'm going to give you a, 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 a preview of the results before I jump in. This is the University of Chicago. I've learned from years of, of both studying here as a student uh, and uh, uh, from, uh, from, from uh, uh, um, presenting papers here that you often don't get through the entire presentation, so it's important to, to give people a sense of what they're going to get at the end. So here, here are the, the two important things. The first one is uh, for what we would consider plausible parameter values, vaccination policy on average actually has a positive benefit to us, larger than we previously thought. And the reason it does that is because on average it slows the evolution of flu. Okay? That's a good thing. Vaccination is more valuable than we think we are, think we, than we think it is, or we prior, previously thought it was. Here's the downside is that the bigger the social benefit of vaccination, the larger are the collective action problems associated with vaccination policy, meaning the following. The reason I get vaccinated is either because I, I be, mainly because I get some personal benefit. Okay? But if the social benefits of other people getting vaccinated are larger than we think because of these evolutionary effects, then the private reason for me to get vaccinated is a little bit smaller. Everybody else is doing my work for me. They're going to prevent me from getting sick. Why should I get vaccinated? Okay? And so that's kind of the, 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 the downside of this. Yes, the social benefits of vaccination are larger than we think, but that also means that the private benefits are a little bit smaller and people have less pers- private incentive to get vaccinated. It might explain the behavior that we see down the road. Now, there's some other nuance that I'm going to tell you about as we get to it, but that, that gives you an overall sense of, of where we're headed. Okay? All right. So let me give you a little bit of background. Um, uh, I think everybody knows a little bit about flu, but, but there's a lot of nuance that you can learn uh, that, that sheds light on, on what we're talking about. Uh, this is going to be a lot of text. I'm going to try to simplify a little bit. Um, so everybody should have heard about H3N2, which is seasonal flu you, in the United States uh, and in Europe. You get it uh, uh, typically in the, in the fall and the winter. Uh, but it affects, uh, it has a huge worldwide impact. In some places it's endemic and it's, avail- it, it, it's, it's circulating year round and not just in, uh, in certain seasons. Um, Worldwide, we think it affects about five to, infects about five to ten percent of adults and twenty to thirty percent of all kids. Uh, there are three three to five million cases of serious sickness and up to five hundred thousand deaths worldwide. We think uh, annually because of flu. And of course, there's always morbidity issues, which is even if you don't die. Uh, anybody here has had flu knows that it's not a pleasant experience. Uh, in the U.S. alone, we think the more economic burden is roughly around eighty-seven billion dollars a year, a very large number. And that's often from people just having to stay home because of the sickness. And that's despite, uh, for example, the fact that we have a vaccination policy, a very strong vaccination policy. Um, and within, within, the all, within flu, there are different types. But the predominant one is something called type A influenza, uh, specifically the one that I've been mentioning, H3N2. It's a specific strain. Um, and that is a strain that's actually fairly recent. It emerged just in 1968. But it is the one that we think causes the most damage. Um, there is a relationship between the different types of flu. You've heard of, of swine, influ- uh, swine flu and avian flu and things like that. 
Those are different strains that have emerged. Sometimes they uh, are strains that are circulating among pigs or among uh, 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 birds uh, that, that, that transfer over, experience zoonosis, and transfer over to humans. Uh, but H3N2 uh, is just one that's been mainly circulating just amongst humans uh, since 68. Now, it's also important to remember that flu circulates globally. This is a very important component of the problem, uh, and it'll help frame exactly what we find. So typically, flu starts in Asia, uh, either East or South Asia. And it spreads to North American Europe and then to South America. That's typical, typically the pattern that we observe. And it starts each year. Um, now, it's seasonal, like the United States, seasonal in places like the United States. Um, but there are other places where it's just there all the time. And that's typically the case in the tropics. The closer you get to the tropics, the more likely it is all year round you'll see flu. Okay? And as I mentioned, flu stains, unlike measles, are constantly evolving. They're acquiring mutations that allow them to avoid existing immunity in host populations, in you guys. Um, and there's a specific way, if you're interested in the biology, we can talk a little bit about that. But there's specific surface protein uh, that changes um, uh, that allows it to basically escape antibodies in your body. Okay. Now, here's a really interesting thing. If you look at the surface uh, of, of, of uh, uh, a flu virus, you would think that there are lots of different ways in which the surface proteins or the, or, or the features of the virus could change to avoid immunity. Another way to think about this is if you think of genetic space as a, a multidimensional uh, uh, space, there are a lot of different directions it could go. It could go up, down, left, right, forward, backwards, all these different directions. And now that's just in three dimensions, but, it, but there are many dimensions. So that would seem to be a really hard problem to solve. But as it turns out, once we started mapping uh, um, uh, the evolution of flu vaccine, we found out that it basically just moves in, in two dimensions. That was a really deep insight. And the second really interesting thing is it tends to go in a straight line in genetic space. It was a profound discovery. And so I want to illustrate that. And that's true for, for, for a number of, of uh, uh, for, for H3N2 but not, and, and some other uh, uh, flu viruses, but not all of them. So let me, let me give you an example. So take H3N2. This is one dimension. This is another dimension. If we look at H3N2 in 68, this is where it started. These are the different uh, types that were uh, uh, sequenced. And then we take strains from 72, 75, 79, 89, 87, so on and so forth. We see that it basically shifts in this straight line. It's not exactly a straight line, but just think about it. It has many, many dimensions along which it could evolve. Even within two dimensions, it could go in circles. It could go in any zigzag pattern. But it tends to go straight, which is really actually quite helpful. Because when we try to plan, figure out what to do next, we know what direction it's likely to head. Okay, So that's something important. Now, we see a little bit of that uh, um, uh, in H1N1. Uh, okay, But you don't see that in, for example, other flu viruses. So it's really kind of just a coincidence that we have that we call this canalization. You're basically following a straight line uh, for flu. Okay, this is going to be important. Not just it's a issue of curiosity, but this is a way that we validate models of flu evolution. We see if it, our models can simulate this sort of evolution. Okay, now a little bit of economics, right? This is the Becker Friedman. Uh, this is the Becker Brown bag. There should be a little bit of economics. So I want to talk a little bit about it. And this gets back to the issue of what are the private benefits and the social benefits of the vaccination, right? So I told you, if you get vaccina vaccinated, you yourself are less likely to get sick. That is a private benefit. You are less likely to get sick and, sick and less likely to die. Now, we know that the best way to avoid infection is vaccine, but it's important to remember that vaccination is not perfect. And it's not perfect for a number of reasons, um, even this season. One reason is that vaccination rates are typically actually quite low. Uh, in the United States and North America, in, in North America and Europe, you actually get reasonable numbers, right? So UK has 75%, uh, the US has something like 50 or 60%. The rest of the, uh, 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 um, uh, you know, if you look in Eastern Europe, you're typically going to get about 10 or 20%. So we're doing pretty good here, but it's important to remember that this is a relatively recent phenomenon. We, you know, I don't know if you remember from when you were young children, at least I'm a little older than you. I didn't remember getting vaccinated very often when I was a kid. This is a very recent phenomenon, something we've seen in the last uh, 15 or so years, this high rate of vaccination. Um, not only that, uh, it's also important to remember that um, even if vaccines might not be perfect. Okay, So e in the following sense, even if they're perfectly targeted, meaning you are vaccinated with the exact strain that is now circulating in the population, 
uh, vaccines don't automatically trigger the sort of immunity you need to prevent infection. The, the immune system is an imperfect process. Um, so there is, for example, even with, and, and don't be depressed, still a good idea to get vaccinated, but even if you get vaccinated, there's a 40% chance that you're going to get uh, infected. And there are certain populations for which it's worse. You guys are generally healthy individuals. The, the rate of return on vaccination are quite high. But if you are an elderly person, there's some elderly people, even if you have vaccinate them, um, they, they just they don't build up the immunity required to protect themselves uh, from flu down the road. Now, that's when it's perfectly targeted. Remember how I said flu drifts in space? You've got to target the vaccine at where it is now. Okay? Even if you target it perfectly, you know, there's, your immune system might not fully uh, uh, generate the sort of immunity you need from that vaccination to prevent you from getting infected. But there's a second problem, which is flu is drifting. What if you aim incorrectly? And that's a problem for us, actually, as a society. And the reason why it's a problem is because we usually select what strains go into the flu vaccine around December. Okay? And we select those strains based upon what is circulating in December of each year. But it takes us about nine months to actually produce uh, and distribute those vaccines. So by the time September rolls around and you get the flu vaccine, guess what? Flu has evolved. So the vaccine that we're distributing is for the strains that were circulating nine months ago, not the strains that are circulating right now. That's called imperfect targeting. And that's yet another reason why vaccination uh, may not be as effective as you want. Now that said, it's still the best way to prevent you from getting flu, and flu's costly. So, you know, cost-benefit analysis is probably a good one. Okay, you should probably get it. But that's the that's the private benefit. Now, one other thing to remember: usually, when you think about the private benefit of vaccination, you think if I get the vaccine this year, I will be protected this year. But the reality is, if you get the vaccine this year, you'll not only get protected this year, but you get protected in future years. And the reason is because immunity is not really narrowly defined. If you get the vaccine and it covers this space right now, right, that's where it's most effective. But if flu is over here somewhere, there's still a risk, a chance that, that the immunity that you have here will prevent that infection. And the reason for that is, uh, quite helpfully, our, uh, our, and I'm, I'm going to simplify here, I'm going to use a, a metaphor. Basically, our antibodies make mistakes. Okay. They sometimes identify as uh, alien invaders things that they uh, are not the same alien invaders they saw last time. Okay, that's helpful for us. That means that last year's vaccine it generates some antibodies that go after the vac uh, go after the flu virus this year, even though the flu virus is a little bit different. Does that make sense? In a way, it helps reduce the risk of imperfect targeting for sure. But another way to think about it, another benefit is that today's vaccine is going to benefit you next year and the year after that, although less each and each year. What your body will have is your body will have antibodies from each prior infection, whether the infection is from you actually getting sick or you getting a vaccine. Exactly, and that's a critical feature. Now, if I were teaching a class, I would ask you, do the old infections really matter given we, what we know about the way flu evolves? Not so much. Here's the reason why. Flu is evolving in line, right? Let's suppose you got infected here. Right? So you built up some immunity. Did it again here. OK? Now flu is over here. Is this immunity going to protect you any more than this immunity? Probably not. Right? It's probably most, your most recent infection that's going to do the most to help you in future infections. And that's just because it goes in a straight line. Right? Does that make sense? It's kind of neat. It's a neat problem. Uh, but, but that, that, so yes, you do retain the old antibodies. They theoretically could be helpful, but practically the newer ones are going to be a little bit more beneficial because it'll be closer to where flu is, given that it goes in a straight line. Okay, but it's important to remember that. Okay, we call that cross immunity. Today's infection helps you, or today's vaccination helps you in the future. So, theory, in theory, we're getting better at modifying and creating new infections. Okay, so you know we're right here. It's 1987, and we think in 1992 it's going to be here. That's what we predict. Couldn't we just, in, before 1992 comes along, make this vaccine, make the, you know, create the strain in a lab, and do it? So yeah, maybe we could. What dangers would that pose? Well, if that, that strain got out of the lab and no one has antibodies. Exactly, right? We don't want to be creating biological weapons at the same time. 
right? So, and we don't feel comfortable that we, we, can, we can avoid that. And, and just because it's going in a straight line doesn't mean there's not variation. What if instead of hitting here, you project it over here? Okay? That would be problematic. Right? You project it over here, it actually ended up here. Not only did you, hey, by the way, uh, miss the mark, but you also spread a new infection. Right? That would be problematic. And I think that's the concern that people have. Now, that doesn't mean that in the future we won't go about doing that. We're just not comfortable with that just yet. We're doing a pretty good job with what we've got. We can do better, and there are people talking about what you're saying, okay? But there is, it's not without risk, okay? So that's the private benefit of vaccination. Let's think about the social benefit of vaccination. I'm sorry, these are smaller words, but, but you know, it, it, I, think, I think I can, I can walk you through it verbally. So as I said, flu is contagious. So if you get vaccinated, you prevent other people from uh, getting, you, you stop yourself from getting uh, uh, the, the infection, but you also stop other people. That, that contagion... Uh, is, uh, uh, you know, stopping that contagion is a big social benefit. And we have lots of evidence uh, of this sort of contagion. Like the, the best example that we have, one of the nicest ones is uh, school holidays are a great way of preventing infection because what ends up happening is what happens on holiday, everybody stays home. They don't congregate in school. As it turns out, flu slows down. So we know that this social connection, like humans are, are, are spreading this uh, between themselves. Um, we also know this from other studies uh, where when we give out vaccines to, to kids in school, as it turns out, their uh, families at home, their adult families, also benefit. They have lower uh, incidence uh, of disease. So we know that. This is, I don't think, requires a lot of, of convincing. Uh, the data is pretty strong about that. And prior uh, economic studies have actually tried to measure the benefit of these externalities. The only problem with those prior studies is they didn't try to account for externalities that are associated with evolution. So what I'm going to show you is that your measure of what the social benefits are depends on not just you know, statically holding a uh, constant where flu is in genetic space right now, seeing like if I give some people the vaccine, how much do I reduce infection people that are not vaccinated? That's the static externality. I also need to think about you know, what is the effect of vaccination on the evolution of flu and then future infections. Does that make sense? So we want to think about how that has, what kind of effect that has. Current studies just focus on the externalities, assuming uh, flu evolution is exo what I call, or what people call, exogenous to vaccination. Okay? Now, here's a nice little table. If you're trying to, you know, I think of a lot of what economics, uh, economists do is just, uh, you know, fancy accounting. And so I'm going to do a little fancy accounting with a little bit of biology. I'm going to think about what the private and social impacts of uh, 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 um, vaccination are um, over time. So I can think about things that are current season and in future seasons. I can think about uh, what happens with the infection, what the private costs are and the social costs are. And then I can do the same thing with, with vaccination. So let's think about vaccination. In the current season, we know that vaccination has a private positive benefit to you. Stops you from getting sick. It also in the current season has a positive social benefit. Stops other people from getting sick. In the future, it also has a private positive benefit to you because today's vaccination will stop you from getting infected tomorrow. That's that cross immunity. And then in the future, there will also be a social benefit. By stopping infection this year, you're also stopping uh, 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 infection uh, next year. Okay? Right? That's what vaccination will do. And we want to basically figure out what, are the, what, is, what happens to the numbers in here when we account for evolution and when we, as compared to when we don't. That's our fundamental economic exercise. So there's a biological exercise, uh, which I'll talk about in a second, and then there's, there's an economic exercise, and we'll do both. Okay, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on prior literature on flu evolution, other than to tell you, look, we didn't invent the idea that, that there's evolution. Evolu that idea's been out there. In fact, in theoretical, uh, on a theoretical level, um, biologists have known for a long time that it's possible that um, medical treatments, including vaccination, can cause uh, evolution. Anybody here heard of an antibiotic resistance? That's exactly the same thing. You take an antibiotic, the bacteria in your body, the ones that you're targeting, in, in fact, even the ones that you're not targeting, uh, will, will mu have mutations. Some of those mutations will help it survive uh, the, the, the antibiotic you put in your bloodstream. Okay? And, and what results is uh, 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 bacteria that are not responsive to the antibiotic. They are resistant to the antibiotic. So when you take an antibiotic, you get antibiotic-resistant bacteria. That's just evolution, but it's to antibiotics. It turns out the same principle applies to vaccines, okay? Not surprising at all. Just people in the flu literature haven't 
really thought about how significant that effect could be. Uh, theoretically, they acknowledge it. They just haven't thought about how significant it could be and, and, and haven't thought about the, the policy implications. So that's what we're going to do. OK, so I'm going to skip this a little bit. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the intuition here. That's the other kind of neat thing. So the, so the biology here is non-trivial. OK, so as I said, we're going to look at uh, the effect of vaccination on, uh, on flu evolution. OK, uh, we're going to take an existing model and we're going to modify it. It's an existing model of evolution. We're going to just add the possibility that there might be evolution in response to vaccination. Then we're going to study the effect of, of, of different types of policy responses and biological parameters on that. We're going to look at uh, what happens most importantly with the vaccination rate, but also other features of uh, the vaccine itself, what it's called the immune breadth. I'll define that in just a little bit. But we'll also think about, and also about vaccine targeting, but we'll also think a little bit about mutation size, which is the distribution mutation. I'm going to explain that in just a, just a second. So let me, let me first kind of give you a graphical illustration of, of how you should think about what's going on. Okay? So let's suppose, and this is, this is antigenic space. Remember two-dimensional antigenic space? Let's just suppose, it's just a model. So I'm just going to start, I'm going to assume right at the origin is where the existing, uh, uh, there's an, a circulating flu strain. It starts right here at the origin, this year, year T. Okay? Now, it infects somebody. That person who's infected gets immunity, right? And as I said, immunity is imperfect. Antibodies make mistakes. That means instead of getting just protection against anything at that spot, you actually get protection in a zone around that spot. It's helpful, OK? Now, that flu strain is constantly mutating. And some mutations are going to fall within this zone and be knocked out. Some mutations are going to fall outside the zone. They might not survive because they don't uh, uh, just catch on in the population. Um, that's a possibility. So it's not immunity that stops it. They just don't catch on. But some of them might catch on and might survive. So let's suppose this guy survives okay, in the population. Then what's happened? Basically, that is the mechanics of what we call antigenic drift, flu evolution. OK? Flu has gone from here to here in the next season. OK? Very simplistic model. Now, all we're saying is the exact same thing can happen with respect to vaccine. Let's suppose that this flu strain is circulating, but we are vaccinating people according to, you know, at this point, OK, with this particular strain. OK? If I vaccinate people with this strain, they're going to generate a zone of immunity that's this purple circle, dotted line. Some strains are going to survive. Those are the ones that are outside the zone. The ones that survive, they'll flourish. But that's, they, they were flourished because they were able to escape this purple zone. But that, too, is drift in response to the zone of protection. Does that make sense? So you could evolve in response, you meaning you, the flu strain, could evolve in response to natural immunity, which is the red circle, or to vaccine immunity, which is the purple circle. Principle is exactly the same. Here's an interesting question. How far will flu evolve depends on a few things if, when you think about vaccination, right? How, but basically, what this circle looks like depends on a few things. One thing it depends on is uh, how far away the, the vaccine is that you were giving people, the strain in the vaccine is, from where flu actually was. Because that'll determine where this purple circle is. Okay? That's one thing that'll matter. We call that uh, targeting error. Okay? And the biggest source of targeting error is due to this lag. Remember, we make vaccines in December. We circulate them in September. In the interim, flu moves on. That's creating this, a gap. Okay? Now, given that flu goes in one particular direction, we know where, where that is. It, it's, it's, the real flu is always going to be a little bit ahead in that line. The second thing that really matters is, well, how big... So I know what the, the, the radius of this red circle is, let's say, but how big is the radius of the purple circle relative to the red circle? Is it big? Bigger? Is it the same? Is it smaller? Sadly, we don't know the answer to that question. But that radius is called immune breadth. Okay? It's just a biological parameter. We don't know the answer. So we're going to try to explore what happens if vaccination gives you more protection or less protection than just actually getting infected. Okay? Does everybody get it? So those are two important policy parameters to think about when 
uh, or two biological parameters and policy parameters to think about when thinking about what effect does vaccination have on evolution. Lag, or the gap here, and the second is how big those circles are, which is breadth. Now, um, I want to actually just graphically show you uh, what goes on. Um, even before graphically, I can show you verbally. So let's ask the question, well, well, okay, hold on a second. What effect does vaccination have on evolution? I know I drew a simple picture, but, but what, like, mechanically, what, what's really going on? So here are a few steps of this. The first and most important thing is that vaccination reduces infection. Okay? Vaccination reduces infection. Now, when flu viruses mutate, the more of, there, more of them there are, the more mutations you'll see, right? So if one of the effects of vaccination is to make people less sick, that means there's going to be less virus floating around in the environment. That means there's going to be less mutation, right? So that's the first thing. That's a good thing. If we just decrease the total amount of mutants we see, that's good. Okay? So that's a positive benefit. But let's suppose that um, uh, uh, beyond that, what happens? Okay, let's suppose, uh, let's try to imagine what happens after that. Then it gets a little bit more complicated. So I want to show you a little figure. Ignore lots of this other stuff. I want to show you just this figure. So what is this figure supposed to be? It should look like a bell curve to you, right? Standard bell curve. It is a bell curve. It's intended to be that. But it's intended to, to describe the distribution of mutations. So when a, when a virus mutates, okay, surface proteins change, the amount of the change uh, uh, can be different each time. Sometimes if you start out right here, you can have a small mutation or you can have a big mutation. And it could go in either direction, in all different directions, right? It could go left or right. In fact, if it's two-dimensional, I should draw a two-dimensional. This is a one-dimensional distribution. But it could go in either direction. It could be small or big. Everybody okay with that? So we can describe a distribution. I'm not saying this is the actual distribution. That's still an unknown parameter. But this gives you an example of what if, the, if we look at one-dimensional space, we imagine this, the mutation could go on either side, what would happen? Well, for the mutation to survive, it has to escape immunity, right? It has to escape either natural immunity if you've gotten infected in the past, or it's got to escape vaccine-acquired immunity, OK? So what does that mean? So let's suppose vaccine-acquired immunity is you've got to get past the, remember that dotted circle I drew? Now just imagine it in one dimension. It would just be like two lines right here. In order to escape, you've got to get outside these lines. You've got to have a mutation that's big enough to get outside those lines. Got it? But here's the interesting thing. Let's suppose you get introduced in 1968, H3N2. Nobody has this. People start getting infected. Then when it comes to 1969, 1970, you have more and more people for whom this is the right model. Okay? And not only that, I'm super simplifying here. There could be some people in the population that bizarrely just had no experience with flu and no experience with vaccination. Actually, it's not that bizarre. Flu doesn't infect that large a percent of the population. It's possible to survive. Okay? So there's going to be some people for whom any mutation will survive, but there's going to be a whole bunch of other people who have a history of either natural of sickness or vaccination for whom this is the right model. And so we'll just take an average of those two. I just want to conceptually describe what's going on because I'm not assigning numbers to these at all. I'm just giving you a concept. Everybody get it? So let's suppose you have some immune history. Either you're naturally, you, you've been infected or you've been vaccinated. You somehow flu that's right here gets into your body in order to survive it has got to avoid your immune system, okay? That means it's got to jump out. It's, there's got to be a mutation that jumps outside these two lines, black lines, okay? Now, to, to understand why this is complicated, is let's suppose that I were to increase those lines, okay, for whatever reason. For example, let's suppose this is based on your natural immunity, and then I give you vaccination, and it pushed out the, your immune breadth. Well, there are two effects that are possible. One seems pretty obvious you are less likely to escape this line than this line, right? Less likely to escape the red line than the black line. That makes sense? That's because this is a distribution. So the fraction, uh, the amount of, of, of area underneath the curve just outside those lines is smaller for the red line than the black line. Does everybody get that? That's the first, that's another positive benefit of vaccination. By, by expanding your immune breadth to some extent, it makes it less likely that there'll be escape. But here's the downside. Let's suppose you do escape. Let's suppose there is a mutation that escaped. That escape will have traveled further. The guys that escape the black line, they're somewhere 
over here, but they could be right here. The guys that escape the red line have to be even further out. Okay? And that's the double-edged sword. So in theory, it is possible that vaccination hastens evolution. Okay, there are arguments for why it could slow evolution, right? It reduces the number of mutations by expanding breath to some extent. It reduces the probability you'll escape. Those are good things. That reduces evolution. But the flip side is, if you do escape, you have to travel much further. And so it's selecting for bigger jumps. Everybody get that? Theoretically, it's unclear what would happen. When we started this project, we didn't know. It's going to turn out things are going to be better, uh, and that's good. But I just wanted you to understand that, that this is not an obvious like, we don't know ahead of time. The theory doesn't dictate the results. This is not Keynesian models asking what the impact of, of government spending is. This is a model where anything could happen, and we want to look at what realistic parameters suggest with some robustness. All mutations, so in theory, right, to explain why you look like the way that you do, the bacteria in your body look like the way they look like, the, the viruses look like the way they look like, you have to give some reason why they're there in genetic space and not somewhere else. And the standard answer is, they're there because they're at least a local maxima in the sense that they, max, they, they locally pr maximize survival, okay? Or replication in particular, okay? Now, it doesn't have to be globally, but at least locally. And any changes have to reduce that, okay? Otherwise, they would have been somewhere else. So we call this fitness cost. And so the idea here is that even when you have these mutations, there'll be fitness costs. That's why, to begin with, you got infected with this guy. But once we add... Uh, vaccination to the mix, or your own natural immunity, you get infected with this guy. The reason you evolved is because there's a bigger fitness cost for you staying here than for you to be out here. Okay? Does that make sense? So yes, there is a cost of uh, mutating, but we select, but, but things mutate because, as it turns out, the fitness costs reverse. What, if you stay where you were before, it's actually worse than if you go to someplace else. The fitness cost is, remaining, is due to remaining the same. You guys ever play Missile Command? Yeah, yeah I loved Missile Command as a kid. So uh, I played four hours. And I thought, this is just Missile Command. That's all we have to do, right? And then, in fact, we could be super cool. We could, we could just vaccinate it around where, where, where the virus is. It would stay in one place. And we could pick the part in genetic space where it's the least costly to humans, has the least morbidity. The problem is we don't know that place. If we know that place, then we could certainly do that. If we know that place, plus we could genetically engineer some stuff, we're good. We're not there. OK? Well, that's a problem. Genetics is really hard to predict. OK. I'm not going to tell you about this other stuff just yet, unless we have time. But that's the basic intuition. That's why it's not obvious what we're going to get. I'm going to rush through the computation model. This is not as uh, interesting, unless you're really interested in the computation model. But, but as I said, um, uh, we pull off an off-the-shelf model, then modify it. And, and we run a ton of simulations. So we have a model where we're basically talking about one world, not different continents. That's an important limitation. Each time we create this uh, hypothetical world, we, we put in 50 million people into it. Uh, that stays fixed. We run this uh, for either uh, for 20 years of, of model time on a, on a daily basis. Okay? But we run that simulation tons and tons and tons of time for each set of parameter values that we want to look at. Okay? Um, Basically, uh, uh, the way that uh, vaccines in our model generate immunity is the same way that natural infection would generate immunity. So we don't create something special for what's going on. We just say that your body builds up immune history from either being infected or being vaccinated. Um, we, uh, uh, one important thing that you have to think about is uh, two important things that you've got to think about. You've got to think about mutation. What does the distribution of mutation look like? So we adopt what is the standard norm in the literature to assume a particular type of distribution, a gamma distribution with certain parameter values. I'm going to get back to that in the last slide. We don't know if that's actually the distribution of, of mutants, mutations. And if that changes, then, then our policy predictions could change. So that's an important caveat uh, that we're going to have. And then in terms of figuring out how far you have to be out uh, uh, before uh, the vaccine uh, immunity erodes or natural immunities uh, uh, protection erodes, we just assume it's linear. The further you are away from your last infection, right? the further away the existing strain is from the last infection, it is proportionally less likely, linearly proportionally less likely to, uh, to infect you. That's it. That, that's kind of the details of the model. Uh, beyond that, it's just uh, it's, it's more mundane details. OK. So now, the first question you should ask yourself is, oh, anybody can write a simulation. How do I know that your simulation is a useful one to, to consider? 
And the way we do this is the way many simulations uh, uh, try to, to, to justify their existence. And that is, can they generate results that fit data that we observe in the real world? Can they generate results that fit the data we observe in the real world? And that's exactly what we hold ourselves to. So here is a plot of where flu drifts in our model, in our simulations. So, and by the way, this is going to be where flu drifts in a world where there's no vaccination. Okay? No vaccination. That is a good way to describe things because in the vast, part, vast uh, uh, um, uh, part of the globe, there is no vaccination. There's only vaccination in certain small areas like the United States uh, and Europe. Okay? And as I'll explain to you, uh, it's not the United States and Europe uh, that will drive evolution. It's what goes on in Asia. So that, that big map that I showed you right, a few slides ago where it looked like it went in a straight line, that was basically driven by uh, um, uh, sequencing that's done of strains that are originate in Asia. This is what comes out of our model. Okay. Now, don't worry that it's going in a diagonal and the other one went straight. That's just the way that I drew the axes. The important thing is it goes in, it's in two dimensions and it goes straight. Okay. That's our va validation exercise. Now, I can give you more details about how, how we check this, but, but the, the pace of change and the direction of change matches what we observe in the data. So that's why we think this is a model worth or simulation worth thinking about uh, when thinking about policy. Okay? All right. This is the simple comparison. Again, all I did is just shift the axes a little bit. I could have drawn the axes to be this way and that way, and it looked very similar. So when we chose parameters, we calibrated off of try to get the, a model with a simulation with zero vaccination to match what we see in the real world, because in the real world, actual vaccination rates are zero. Remember, if we look at this, vaccination only starts around here, and it only is in North America and Europe for the most part. There's hardly any vaccination in Asia, which is driving much of this. And even in North America and, and, and Europe, there's not much vaccination during much of the history. So we want to use a zero vaccination model as our benchmark. So we run our simulation with zero vaccination and see if what we get looks like this. That's how we validate. Okay? Now, this shouldn't surprise you. It's not a, just an off the, it is the, the most uh, used off the shelf model, and it's most used because of this. That's all. All I've told you is, this got published in a really good journal, and there's a reason why it got published in a really good journal, and so we're going to use that model. Okay? There's no surprise here. If we'd gotten something different, we probably would have thought we coded it wrong. Okay? As it turns out, we borrowed their code, too. One of the nice things about science, just take somebody else's code uh, from a published paper. Okay? But it's a reason why you should pay attention to this. Even if I'm justifying telling you how great the old paper was, this is a reason why you should pay attention. Okay. So now let's, let's, let's not think about the results that we're getting. I, I know we're running, running, we've only got about 10 minutes left, but I, I want to show you what we're getting. The first thing I want to tell you is that evolution matters. Okay, and let me explain these graphs. So what I'm going to show you is a series of graphs where on the x-axis you get different vaccines, different vaccination rates from either 5% of the population getting vaccinated, 10%, 15%, 20%. Okay, those are high numbers, as it turns out. Yes, the U.S. is a little bit higher, but it's only a fraction of the world's population. So you've got to think about these as being pretty large numbers for, on a global basis. So this is vaccination rate. The y-axis in this graph, you're going to get antigenic drift. This is if, 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 the, if the flu evolved, if started over here, how far did it, it drift over 20 years? Okay? Um, I don't need to get into the technical details, but I can tell you what the units are uh, in Q&A if you guys have a question. But, but what I wanted to basically show you is what happens with cumulative drift, and then what I care about is incidence of the disease. Okay? And you're going to see there's a strong relationship between the two. The more uh, vaccine drifts, the more incidence you're going to see. And the reason is because the further out it is, the less likely your existing immunity is going to protect you. That means you're going to get more infection. Okay? So faster drift is bad. Now, if you look at the uh, uh, yellow line, that is a model that we simulated where we shut down the mechanism through which uh, vaccination can affect your immunity, and thus vaccination can affect drift. So in the yellow lines, you're basically going to see what would happen if evolution was not responsive to vaccination. Okay? And let me break down those lines. The solid line at the bottom is basically how much, for example, drift or cumulative infection you're going to get as the vaccination rate increases on average. The solid line is on average. The dotted line up here is as it turns out, in a lot of our simulations, the biggest impact of vaccination is it drives flu extinct. Okay? And remember, these are global models. So if we got 
uh, according to this global model, if you drove that global vaccination to 15%, we're nowhere near that, even though we are have pockets of it in places like North America and Europe. If you get global vaccination to 15%, you basically drive flu extinct, which is really a, a neat idea, right? But there's a chance that you don't. And if you don't, like for example, at 10%, there's a chance that you don't, then you're going to get some surviving strains. And the question is, what happens to those surviving strains? How much do they drift? Does that make sense? So yes, vaccination would be good because it could drive things extinct. But if it doesn't, it could make things worse. That's a possibility. The yellow line shows what would happen if we just assumed that, that evolution didn't respond to vaccination. The purple line shows what happens when uh, evolution is responsive to vaccination. And you can see there's big differences. The average level of drift, like the, the average level of drift falls because there's a lot more extinction. Okay. And even amongst things where there's not drift, where there's not extinction, in, in simulations where there's not extinction, you're seeing that, the, the, that the, the amount of evolution you see is different than what would happen if you didn't allow evolutionary effects. Okay, this is just, all I'm trying to show you is evolution matters in this off-the-shelf model in a very big way. We should pay attention. Now let me tell you the big lessons. The most important lesson to take out of what we get is that greater vaccination reduces average drift. If there's one lesson you take away, greater vaccination, according to our research, reduces average drift. It slows down the evolution, on average, slows down the evolution of uh, influenza, of H3N2. That's going to be a good thing. However, there are situations where despite doing that, if you don't kill the infection, you don't drive it extinct through vaccination, the ones that survive could drift further uh, than would have happened if you never vaccinated at all. Okay, That shouldn't surprise you. That comes straight out of the theory. On average, you're going to stop escape. But if escape does happen, it's going to go pretty far, right? It's very consistent with the theory. So it is possible that in, for some parameter values, yes, for almost all parameter values, you're going to, on average, do good. But there are some, small, some, some situations, some simulations, where if you don't drive flu extinct, it's actually going to drift further, in which case you're going to have more incidence and more morbidity and mortality. OK? Now, before you all go and say, let's stop vaccination, that's not all the simulation. In most simulations, it doesn't do that. So for example, it depends on immune breadth. If the breadth of immunity that you get from vaccination is the same as the breadth of immunity that you get from Sorry, if the breadth of immunity that you get from vaccination is the same as the breadth of immunity you get from actually getting sick, okay, equal breadth, and we have no reason to think that there'll be different breadth because of the way that we, we vaccinate you with inactive versions of, of, the, of the virus. If the breadth is the same, not only does average drift decline with, with more vaccination, but also even for situations where flu is not driven extinct, you're still getting a decline in drift, OK? This is, by the way, this line right here, this is what would happen if you have zero vaccination, meaning no uh, vaccination at all. And it shows that basically, even for situations where you don't drive things extinct, you're getting less drift. Drift is falling as you vaccinate more. By the way, the reason why this line stops here is because at that level of vaccination, globally, remember, it's very important to keep this in mind, globally, not in the United States. Basically, once you hit 10% vaccination, at, Flu goes extinct. Okay. Somebody should ask, well, why don't we just get 10% vaccination globally? <laughs> yes, and I think we should solve global poverty, too, and global warming. <laughs> Those would be great ideas. It's really hard to do. 10% is really hard to do, OK? Just, it's a large world, and there are a lot of people living in areas that we have trouble reaching, and our infrastructure is not that great. So this is a big deal if we get to 10% vaccination, OK? It's not like flu feels like it must be spread over the globe. It just spreads wherever it can. And so if there's a pocket where you don't vaccinate, it'll just stay there. And that's really dangerous, too, because it'll just hang out in that population. And then later on, you think, oh, well, flu's gone and extinct, right? So we can eliminate our vaccination policy, and then flu will spread everywhere else. Got it? So the reason it's hard is you've got to uniformly vaccinate 10%. That's really hard. So just keep that in mind. Yes, we're great in the United States, but that's not really helping the United States in the long run. Uh, uh, what we need to do is we need to get the world vaccinated. Much difficult, much more difficult challenge. Okay? So this is, this is, this, there's good news here. Okay? Vaccination has a positive impact. It reduces average 
evolutionary drift, which means it reduces average uh, incidence. If we get it to high enough, we can get extinction. We should just be careful that if it turns out, we should do research, and if it turns out that the breadth of immunity, number one, if it turns out that the breadth of immunity from vaccination is much smaller than the breadth of immunity from natural infection, it could be the case that if we fail to drive the virus extinct, we could actually make the virus evolve further, which means more death and more morbidity. That's some, just a caveat. It's not the most likely result, but it's a caveat. And the second caveat that I want to make is it assumes that we have the mutation distribution right. If the mutation distribution is more, has less variance, it's tighter, vaccination would be even more effective, more valuable than I say it is, or that we say it is. However, if the distribution of mutations is wider, if it has higher variance, you get the opposite, which means that it could be that even with bigger breadth, um, you still get uh, more drift, assuming you don't drive it extinct. No matter what, we think that you're probably going to drive it extinct. That's the most likely result, but there's, you've got a plan for, for bad case outcomes as well. Okay. Um, so I also want to talk a little bit about the private benefit of vaccination and the public benefit of vaccination. And, and I, want to, I, I, want to, I want to skip away some of this stuff, but given, the, given the time. But, but I want to say what, what we did to try to address the problems. OK, so we ran um, simulations. Uh, we varied uh, vaccination rates. We varied immune breadth. Uh, um, we even uh, did things like, uh, although I'm not showing you these, very uh, uh, lag. We tried to play around with the mutation distribution a little bit. Okay? But we take the results of these. And we don't just run one simulation of each. We run a large number of simulations of each combination of parameter values. Uh, and we generate data from that. What is the cumulative drift? What is the cumulative uh, incidence? Okay? And now you've got this big data set. It's very, very large. Okay? It's so large, it's hard to work with, so we work with a subset of the random subsample of our own data. Uh, and we run some basic regressions. And we ask, okay, what is the benefit of an individual getting vaccinated as opposed to not getting vaccinated in terms of their probability of getting infected? And then, what is the benefit of, to other people of, of you getting vaccinated? And the way we calculate that is what, if we assume that society has a certain level of vaccination rate, what is the impact on your probability of getting infected, even if you don't get vaccinated? Does that make sense? So that's what our regression analysis looks like. Okay, so technical description of the regression that we're getting. And I wanna give you a sense of what we're finding. And by the way, we do this by saying, hey, Let's account for, and this, remember, in this, in this data, it's each individual that we're looking at. Each individual. Did they get infected for each of these 20 years? And we have daily data. Uh, and there are 50 million people per agents in each simulation and tons of simulations. So we can look at how many years ago did they get vaccinated. We can look at what the vaccination rate was. Okay? We don't look at vaccination rates above 10% because basically in, in, in most of the simulations, you basically, once you get 10%, you're going to get extinction. So there's no data left uh, to do regressions off of. Um, OK, what are the things that we find? We find two results, which are not going to surprise you. Once you know that, on average, vaccination reduces the drift of uh, uh, flu, slows it down, you know that there is a positive social benefit of vaccination that we hadn't thought of before, right? Not only do you stop other people from getting infected, but you slow down the rate of infection, the, the drift of infection. Why is that beneficial? That means that you're going to get more cross immunity. That means pre previous year's uh, uh, natural immunity or vaccine acquired immunity is going to uh, protect you even going forward. That's, that's a big uh, component of this. OK? So we know that there's that big social benefit from slowing down evolution, and we know that that's the average effect. But think about it this way. What is your private incentive to get vaccinated if you know that the vaccination policy for the country is going to reduce your risk of getting infected even if you don't get vaccinated? Your private benefit falls too, right? Okay, why should you get vaccinated and deal with going to the doctor and the pinprick and all that if basically the risk of flu just fell because of vaccination policy? So the bigger the social benefit of vaccination, the smaller the private benefit. That's always been the conundrum with vaccination. It's a conundrum with lots of things like antibiotic resistance and the like too, but true with vaccination. So, so the positive thing is, hey, great. Once we account for evolution, vaccination is better from a social perspective. The problem is it gives 
individuals less incentive to get vaccinated because they think policy is doing all the work. And that raises a different policy question. How do we change that balance? Does that mean we have to subsidize vaccination even more? More once we, once we vaccinate? The answer is probably going to be yes. We need, the, we need to get people uh, to see the social benefit. And that might mean things like Peruvian taxes where we pay people more. In some places, you could imagine that uh, uh, you might want a policy where you require it and there are fines if you don't get it, something like that. But you do need to, to adjust for that and focus more on that. Does that make sense? I want to, uh, it's, it's already 1 o'clock. I want to, want to point out some few important things. I want to stress again that um, it depends on the parameter values. The results that I'm showing you depend on the parameter values we have. We, we think these are reasonable parameter values, but we understand that it could be different. There could be different breadth than what we think. Uh, uh, and the narrower the breadth, the, the, the more pessimistic I'd, I'd come across. It could be the distribution mutation is a little bit wider than we think, that it just has more variation. If that's the case, then I would have to be a little bit more pessimistic than I am today. That's number one. So those are the number one caveat I want to give. The second caveat I want to give is the following. When you hear in the press, in journal articles, hey, here are the economic or medical benefits of vaccination, how should you interpret that after you hear this uh, paper? Here's what you should say. Where did that research take place? If that research took place in the United States, in Europe, odds are this paper is not related. And the reason for that is in the United States and in Europe, um, vaccination does not affect evolution. You want to know why? It's very much related to what you said, by the way. OK? Let's suppose you get vaccinated a lot in the US and Europe. Our paper suggests that's going to slow down evolution, correct? But then there's a whole part of the other world, Asia, Africa, South America, where there's no vaccination. Okay? Their flu is going to evolve faster, right? And you just need a small amount of travel across the different regions for the faster evolving strain to spread worldwide. So you know what we think? This is the kind of the hidden secret. Uh, uh, hidden in the sense that it's, it's actually it's not really hidden because it's in journal articles. It's just not popularly known. What we think happens each year is that we get a new strain of flu, but it's not the strain of flu in the United States or Europe evolving. It's the strain that evolved in Asia, constantly reseeding the United States, reseeding meaning seeding again, the United States and Europe. So every year we get a new strain, but it's the strain that has been evolving in, in Asia. Does that make sense? OK, in that world, vaccination policy in, India, in the US and in, in, in Europe is not affecting evolution. Evolution is all driven by what's going on in Asia, because that's where you're not vaccinating. Right? So now, if I publish a study that says, look, in the United States, here's the economic benefits of vaccination, you're going to say, yes, that's the economic benefits of vaccination, assuming that you don't have any impact on evolution, that evolution is just exogenous to what's going on with vaccination policy in, in North America and Europe. So that's important for you to remember. OK? It's important for you to remember. Those studies are not that helpful. What's a little bit more helpful is if you could do studies outside of the US and Europe. But even then, you have to be a little bit careful. Because let's suppose that you decide to do a study in Hong Kong. This has been done, by the way. You do decide to do a study in Hong Kong, a little bit closer to the action in terms of evolution, right? And you go and, I'm, and say, I'm going to vaccinate a community and see what happens, measure the economic benefits. Well, that's really interesting. But the problem is you're only vaccinating a small population. It's that community. What you care about is the evolution that's happening all over China, all over Southeast Asia, all over India. Right? Getting a pocket won't help you because the next year, guess what, what, what kind of flu is going to end up in that pocket? It's the flu that evolved somewhere else. Okay, so this is a hard thing to study. We still need to study it, right? And especially as we spread vaccination globally. Um, but you need to keep those, those studies that we see out in the world. But you have to understand that you've got to take them with a grain of salt. They cannot capture the evolutionary benefit. We need to come up with new ways to do that. And so that's one of the things that, that, that Sarah and I uh, and Frank are thinking about. Okay, let me stop there because I know there's only supposed to go to one o'clock, right? And I, as usual, talk over time. Happy to take more questions afterwards. I've got I've got a little bit of time.